Good evening. We hope everyone's keeping well in these crazy times. It's my absolute privilege to welcome you all this evening on behalf of our UI Australia leadership team, our state presidents, Hayley Southwick from Victoria, Andrew Boyarski, New South Wales, Todd Wilner from West Australia, Esther Frankel, and Jeremy Liebler, president of our partner, the Zionist Federation of Australia. The relationship between UIA Australia, the Zionist Federation, and the Jewish Agency is exceptionally strong. Not only is KHUI Australia one of the largest funders of the Jewish Agency outside of North America, but the Zionist Federation is also one of the most active and proactive Zionist roof bodies in the Jewish world today, enabling many of the Jewish Agency's programs in Australia. It is therefore fitting that our two organizations, the primary links between the Australian Jewish community and Israel are hosting president-elect Isaac Bougie Herzog this evening. I would like to acknowledge Sam Grunwald, world chairman of Karen Ayasod UIA from Jerusalem and chairman of the World Board of Trustees of KHUIA, Stephen Lowy, who will formally introduce our speaker a little later. Tonight, we also have Mark Liebler, former chairman of the World Board of Trustees, and Penny Hurst, president of UIA International Women's Division. Welcome, everybody. Before Stephen introduces Bougie, we thought it opportunistic and appropriate to hear a magnificent rendition of the prayer for the welfare of the State of Israel. This version is sung by the chief chazan of the IDF, Shai Abramson, accompanied by the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra and Choir. Very few of us knew that the prayer was in fact authored by Bougie's grandfather, Rabbi Isaac Halevi Herzog, who was the chief rabbi of Ireland until 1936, and then the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of British Mandatory Palestine, and then the State of Israel from 1936 until his passing in 1959. Although the prayer for the state has been modified by Jewish communities worldwide, who recite it in synagogue on a weekly basis, the prayer continues to serve as an important symbol of Jewish and Israeli unity and solidarity. This is certainly one of the key roles of our honored guest tonight, the president-elect, who will be introduced after this moving prayer. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor and privilege, particularly after such a moving and historic prayer, to introduce tonight to the Australian Jewish community, the the outgoing chairman of the Jewish Agency and president-elect of Israel, Isaac Bougie Herzog. As chairman of the World Board of Trustees of Karen Hayasad, I have come to know Bougie very well over the past two and a half years. He and his dear wife, Michal, the next first lady of Israel, have become friends of Judy and me. Bougie is also very well known to many of you on tonight's Zoom. As he, has visited Israel, as he has visited Australia and has many friends here. I'm sure you all feel very proud to know that he and Michal will soon reside in Beit Hanasi, the home of the President of Israel. I had the honour on behalf of Karen Hayasad of saying thank you to Bougie just two nights ago at his last Jewish Agency executive meeting on which we both served. It was a wonderful occasion and for those members who were in Israel, Bougie's last meeting took place in the historic room where the first Knesset was sworn in. That room bears a photo, including Bougie's late grandfather, who Lance has already spoken about. It is also next to Bougie's office, still for the next few days, which was the office also of David Ben-Gurion. What you may not know, to many of you, is that this building houses the National Institutions of Israel, the Jewish Agency, the WZO, KKL, as well as Karen Hayasad. In 1948, the entrance of Karen Hayasad was a subject of a terrorist attack, which sadly killed and injured many, including Bougie's mother, who, thank God, survived under the rubble of the attack. The Herzog name is very famous in Israel and the Jewish world, 
which Bush, with Bush's grandfather, as you know, as a chief rabbi and his father, a former president. But Bushy is not in his position now due to his name. He is there due to his personal achievements and career serving the state of Israel and the Jewish people. There is no doubt in my mind that Bushy is the right person at the right time to become the next president of Israel. He served as an officer in the elite unit 8200 of the IDF Intelligence Corps before entering politics and becoming a member of the Knesset in 2003, he was a partner at the prestigious law firm Herzog, Fox and Neiman. In his many years in the Knesset, Bushy served in many ministerial posts, including most relevant to Australia, Minister of Diaspora Affairs, and was also chairman of Israel's Labor Party, as well as the Knesset opposition leader. In 2018, Bushy was elected to the position of Chairman of the Executive of the Jewish Agency, succeeding Natan Sharansky. So you can see how well prepared he is to serve, not only in the role of President of Israel, but as President of all Jews. He's uniquely placed to deal with the many challenges in Israel, the diaspora, the relations between Israel and the diaspora, as well as issues in the non-Jewish world. Most importantly, alarming levels of anti-Semitism, and the delegitimization of Israel. In particular, Bushi's wonderful personal style, boundless energy, wisdom, and ability to listen will help bring the Jewish world together for a common purpose. Bushi, you are leaving the Jewish agency in a far stronger position than when you entered. You have successfully led the organization through a major strategic review and the COVID health and economic crisis and re-established the respect for the agency that it deserves. For an organization that is over 90 years old and was the government of Israel pre-1948, this is an achievement for which you should feel very, very proud. The Jewish Agency is Karen Hayasod's most important strategic partner, delivering our key programs of Aliyah and absorption, social needs, particularly in the periphery of Israel, as well as strengthening the partnership between Israel and our diaspora communities. The partnership we created personally between us will stand both organizations in good stead for many, many years to come. For at least the next seven years, this will be the last time, Bougie, that I address you as Bougie. It will be a great honor to address you as Mr. President and stand for you when you enter the room. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Israel's president-elect, Isaac Herzog. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, dear Stephen. You're a dear friend. Uh, I have tremendous respect for you and your family. Uh, we worked together very closely, and I had the pleasure of getting to know your wife, Judy, and the entire family. You're devoting enormous time and efforts on behalf of the Jewish people, the state of Israel. So thank you wholeheartedly. Dear friends, distinguished members of the Australian Jewish community and Karen I saw UIA Australia, I'm so happy to speak to you. Members of the Zionist Federation of Australia, my good friend, Jeremy Liebler, who will be having a conversation with me. My good friend, Lance Rosenberg, who heads uh, the campaign, and uh, I also had the pleasure of knowing his late mother. And of course, uh, my good friend, Sam Grundwerg, who's here right with me, uh, the world chairman of Kern Isod. Um, I'm very uh, overwhelmed, I must say. I'm overwhelmed because when I heard the prayer for the well-being of the state of Israel, which was written by my late grandfather, Rabbi Isaac Alevi Herzog, uh, who I carry his name proudly. And yesterday we had the Yort site uh, for uh, 62 years since he passed away. Uh, and of course, it touches my innermost feelings because we love the state of Israel and we care for the well being of the Jews. And my grandfather wrote, May God, of course, visit all our brothers and sisters all over the world. And of course, bring him to their ancient new homeland. And we, since then, are working diligently to connect 
to connect the state of Israel to Jewish communities, to connect Jews all over the world to the state of Israel and to one another, to protect and defend them and fight anti-Semitism, to educate and perpetuate Jewish continuity, Jewish identity, and naturally to encourage those who want to, to make Aliyah to the state of Israel and to protect the good name of the state of Israel, which is under constant attack by elements and voices who have no real clue about what greatness this state resembles. I'm extremely proud of the unique relationship between Israel and Australia. I had a, an enormous visit. I visited Australia a couple of times, but the last visit was just on the eve of my entering office as chairman of the Jewish Agency in uh, August, as uh, July, August 19, 2018. And I visited all of your communities and events of Karen I Sod and the Zionist Federation. And you're just a terrific, terrific community. I am also very much aware of from my predecessor, the 10th president of Israel, Ruven Ruby Rivlin, how he was impressed by visiting uh, this community and being hosted by Karen I Sod UI Australia. And I can tell you outright that I vividly recall my parents, my late father, Chaim Herzog, my mother, Aura, uh, may she be healthy. Um, back in 1986, in a major state visit, it was the first state visit of an Israeli president visiting an entire communities in Australia and how it has struck so deeply in the cords and hearts of so many of you who are still active and are now leaders in the community. Some of you were still children in, in the Jewish schools that you maintain so greatly in, in Australia. I, for one, uh, have, uh, have been following Australia-Israel relationships since I went into politics, and I care deeply about the unique relationship between our nations. Mm -hmm. And in my new capacity as president of Israel, I will do whatever I can to foster and strengthen these relationships, and of course, maintain the strong relationship with the Jewish communities all throughout Australia, the Zionist Federation, Karen Sod, the leadership and the members, and hope to be visiting you as well and bringing the unique voices of Israel in your homes as well. I know that you're in lockdown in some areas, Sydney, for example, I know it's difficult. I'm sure you'll get out of it. You're still one of the most impressive states in the world. Israel is looking forward to seeing you all here Be'ezrat Hashem in the nearby future, your foreseeable future. And I'm broadcasting to you from the room where the first Israeli cabinet ever convened, where the Zionist movement convened in Yerushalayim. It's called the Ben-Gurion Room. And you have the pictures of Chaim Weizmann and Theodor Herzl behind me. And these walls have heard everything. They were there before the state of Israel was created. And naturally, naturally, now we have different challenges in our generations. And I'm assuming responsibility as the leader of the state of the Jews, as the president of Israel, humbly, but also I'm very much aware of the challenges of the era. And I look forward to sharing with you and working with you in order to overcome these challenges. And thank you wholeheartedly for your great support of the State of Israel. Toda Rabba to all of you. Thanks, Bougie. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight. It, it really is an honor. And um, before we start um, and we have a bit of a chat, I just want to echo both Lance and Stephen's sentiments and tell you how absolutely delighted we all are um, in the Australian Jewish community and, and the Jewish world um, when we heard that you would be the next president of the State of Israel. And I'll say that again because I like saying it, because I like hearing it. And it's not just because of the close relationship that we have um, uh, we have with you, we work closely with you, our partners over the last few years, and it's not just because you've got this long-standing relationship with Australia and the Australian Jewish community. And, and we all, I was seven and I vividly recall um, your father's visit, but um, it's because we know that you'll be a president, not just of all Israelis, but of the Jewish people. And, and we know that you will bring to that role the, the inspiration, the passion, the, the empathy that you brought to the role as chair of the Jewish Agency. And I think in these difficult and challenging times, it's something we all need. 
So um, with that said- I mention, if I can say, Jeremy, that I want to thank you and your entire family, who I know well, and your, great, your father, who I deeply appreciate and respect. So thank you for your service. Thank you. So Bushi, let, let's start um, with, with, with your time at the Jewish Agency. It's been an incredibly successful term. We in Australia have been direct beneficiaries of that success, but we're short on time. So if you had to pick just one accomplishment that you're really proud of over the last few years, what, what would it be? I already mentioned two. One was the emergency, the immediate, because it's actually still affecting you guys, but that's during COVID. If you look at it correctly, you know, during COVID, a lot of truth transpired. And part of it was the fact that there are many communities all around the world, Jewish communities, who are non-sustainable, but are there because they have to keep going according to, you know, the way history leads Jewish communities. And they are brothers and sisters, and they found themselves in a dysfunctional economic uh, model because take, for example, smaller communities, 2000 Jews, somewhere in Latin America, somewhere even in Europe or in other places. And they, the community is aging. Uh, many left the community or went to Israel, North America or elsewhere or to another town. Uh, and the, the, the school, the Jewish school or kindergarten is all based on private funding and they are simply collapsed in COVID. So we, the Jewish agency, were the first ones to establish together with Karen Isod and the Jewish federations of North America an emergency fund to help communities. We literally helped over 75 communities by giving them a special loan with no interest for a couple of years to save the community and its ability or other institutions. So this is something I'm very proud of because you want to keep Jewish life going wherever, wherever they are with no harassment and no impediments uh, and, and enable the entire Jewish collective to be self-sustainable uh, in such circumstances. What I'm very proud of in the Jewish agency, because it is the biggest Jewish organization in the world, the Sochnu, is that we are focusing on three pillars of strategy, which were agreed upon what Stephen mentioned. And there are three, three top issues of our lives. One is Aliyah. We are foreseeing a major wave of Aliyah to Israel following COVID. We are seeing it in front of our eyes. In, front, in fact, during COVID, 22,000 Jews came in the year of COVID with no flights, quarantine and all, all the limitations and still came for 50 countries. So the engine goes on. The ancient old plight of the in gathering of the exiles goes on. The second is connecting Jews to one another and to the state of Israel. This is a major challenge because because there are many Jews out there, young Jews, including in your communities, who are asking questions or casting doubt, who want to know why, why is Israel important? And what does it mean, call Israel Arivim Zebaze, all Israel guarantee each other. And indeed, this is something we put major focus on in the last few years. And I must say, we are producing programs that are really impacting communities such as the Australian Jewish communities successful programs with our Shlichim and Shinshinim, with all the immersive programs and others, including when you have to do it on Zoom. And lastly, your impact, the world Jewish impact on Israeli society. So listen to this. Most Israelis have no clue what world Jewry is all about. They know that we are the state of the Jewish people, but they do not understand what Jewish life abroad means. Only those who are exposed to it. Same goes for many, many Jews abroad who have no clue what Israel is all about. They're simply reading a newspaper here and there or watching CNN or any other channel. We made a major effort to connect, to create further partnerships, twinning schools, programs, educating all of young Israelis about world Jewry, diaspora Jewry, and so forth and so on. This is a major flagship of ours, and I'm very proud of it. Well, you know, that's a, that's a good entree to talk a bit more about the Israel diaspora relationship. And, you know, in, in a, I think a week's time or so, there probably has never been a president 
um, hold office that's had a better understanding of the diaspora. And I guess, you know, in one sense in Australia, we're very proud that we're an outlier. Um, we, we have our challenges within this community, but overall we are a very strong, proud and enormously Zionist community. But it's a, it's a different picture in other parts of the world, particularly in the United States. And there have been various proposals over the last few years, including by your predecessor, Natan Sharansky, um, around different ideas, mechanisms to give a voice to the Jewish diaspora, uh, particularly to Israeli decision makers. And so I've always sort of haven't quite been convinced about these structures, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what's your perspective on um, whether or not we need to formalize a voice from the Jewish diaspora to the to the people and the government of Israel, or if there are other ways to, to sort of address, I guess, this growing rift. So uh, it is a very valid issue because I think it's essential that there is a clear platform enabling the Jewish world to express itself within Israeli public life because they are Israeli policies affect Jews all over the world. And needless to say, the nation state of the Jewish people, of course, we have a full responsibility of the fate of the Jewish people. Now, how to go about it is complicated. In the, in the early generations of Israel, it was viewed as something even impossible because, you know, we all want to see <clears throat> all the Jews in gather in Israel. But now we're all much more realistic and open. It's a mobile world and people can relocate and move. And whilst we encourage Aliyah, we also encourage, as I said, the flourishing of Jewish communities worldwide. So there are many models proposed. We uh, want to say naturally that the Jewish agency and the World Zionist Organization are actually organizations controlled and, 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 and led by world Jewry. Uh, my board of governors, which is comprised of 250 Jewish leaders from all over the world is comprised of Jewish representatives of Jewish communities from all over the world. Basically, you're like the parliament of the Jewish world. And same goes for the Zionist Congress. However, how to funnel this into a process whereby the Jewish voice is heard is more complicated. There was a piece of legislation which we worked on with a former MK, Tila Friedman, whereby we will be part of the process Nothing happened, nothing transpired. I think Pr Prime Minister Bennett is very open to this. He was like me, Minister of Diaspora Affairs. We'll have to come forward with something which doesn't create another boring mechanism which everybody hates and everybody puts, you know, uh, uh, stones on the way and so forth and so on. It has to be some sort of a process. And I clearly, clearly uh, want to focus on this issue when I am there. It's interesting when I was a, when I was growing up, you know, I think, you know, the average sort of certainly in Australia, but I, I suspect the same in the United States, the, the way that the ordinary Jew in the diaspora connected to Israel was by, you know, their yearly or monthly check that they would write to often Karen Hayesod or other Israeli institutions. And what a lot of people don't quite um, appreciate today is that that financial relationship, which of course still exists today, and um, you know, is is two ways. And in Australia, I know, but I've learned certainly over the last few years that we here are major beneficiaries um, of the financial support that comes from Israel, in the form of Masa, um, you know, uh, long-term Israel programs, Taglit Birthright. They are core to maintaining Jewish identity in the diaspora. But there is, there's a lot of discussion and criticism today that says, well, you know, Israel is a first world country, the startup nation, a strong economy. And so we have many Israeli billionaires today. We don't need diaspora support. So I'd be interested to hear how you view the dynamic between the diaspora and Israel and the, the sort of two-way financial support and its importance in, in maintaining the relationship beyond the dollars themselves. So that is also evolving into something very interesting. First of all, because it is true that there is an echelon of Israelis who are giving and, and very much involved. And we have a subsidiary called Israel Spirit, where we have top-notch Israelis 
partnering with diaspora jewelry and programs within Israel. But the two-way street is something most important. There is a growing investment of the Israeli government. And by the way, the Jewish agency as part of its mission in worldwide uh, jewelry in various programs. I'll give you an example. We run a security assistance fund, which has helped over 700 Jewish institutions around the world mm -hmm. in securing their security installations and literally saving lives. Just another example. Israeli, uh, many, about 11 Israeli ministries are dealing with world jewelry in all sorts of ways and means. Masa and birthright are just an example. And many other programs, including programs of Jewish education, Hebrew education, and things of this nature. However, the support that your communities are giving to Israel through Karen Isod and UIA is vital. First of all, because you, it's, it's your, it's your footstep in Israel and because you can select and opt to where and how you want to help. Secondly, it's part and parcel of the entire Jewish collective. Your ability, the success of this community has enabled it to be extremely important when it helps other Jews all over the world and in Israel. Thirdly, because you have a very high rate of poverty in Israel because of the enormous waves of Aliyah from all over the world, including, for example, the 2000 Ethiopian Jews, which just came this year to the state of Israel. All this requires many more efforts than simply a government budgeting. And it's also part and parcel of an educational process because your next generation comes over, sees the projects, identifies with something emotionally. So I think it's evolving into a very nice vista of cooperation. Thank you. And um, I know we're, we're short on time and you've got many places to go, but just um, I just want to briefly touch on the issue of anti-Semitism now. Um, you know, the, the recent conflict um, in Israel and, and with Gaza, while in the Jewish community here, we certainly were not sitting in bomb shelters like many of our friends and family were in Israel, but we felt it like we have never felt it before. Um, between social media, the general mainstream media, um, people who we work with, um, who we are friends with. And it was like this, this hidden beast sort of started rearing its head again. And more often than not, it manifests itself under the guise of anti-Zionism. They don't use the word Jew, they use the word Zionist. And I, I suppose I, I want to hear, what, what do you think the role is of the state of Israel in helping diaspora communities deal with this new manifestation of anti-Semitism? It is a very worrying challenge. We are foreseeing a rise of anti-Semitism all over the world in combination with anti-Israelism. We, what we saw in the last operation was a, a cruel misjudgment of the facts. I sat in a shelter in which I sat in at the age of six in the 67 war. And you say to yourself, this cannot recur. And yet we were heavily bombarded. And no one who attacked us and criticized us has not gone through this experience. And it is just another onslaught on Israel from all over the world and enormous pain because Israelis really truly do not want to inflict pain on their enemies. But if they have to, they have to defend themselves. I think that we are very much aware of the dangers. This story has come up strongly in the Israeli media and public discussions, and I think also in the security echelon. And a lot of efforts we are going to be put again into uh, securing and helping Jewish communities abroad. Also in presenting our case better. I think there was an error there in the way our case was not fully presented in the modern tools. And I would expect a, what we call a startup nation to be more efficient on that. And I tend to bring it up with Prime Minister Bennett who comes from the high tech world and understands a few things about it. So yes, thank you very much for bringing this issue. Thanks Bougie. And before I hand over just to Sam, you know, I just guess on a personal note, you know, you've 
Lance and, and Stephen and you, we talked about your, your grandfather and your father. And, and I know, I, I think it was your grandfather's yard sale this week. And I read some- Yeah, yes, yesterday, that's what yesterday, I said. That's right. And, and, I, and I read some beautiful you know, stories about him and particularly around his efforts after the Shoah in finding children, Jewish children who were hidden in monasteries and rescuing them. Sure, um, he saved hundreds and hundreds of them. And I, I sort of, I couldn't help but think to myself, what was going through your mind at that moment, wherever you were, whenever it was, when someone told you the outcome of, of the vote, and that you would with certainty be the next president of Israel. I told you I'd say it again. And I mean, I can only imagine, you know, on the one hand, this, this sense of enormous privilege in, in occupying this role, but also a huge sense of responsibility. And I wonder, what do you think that your father and your grandfather, if they, if they were here today, what, what advice do you think that they would give you before you assume this very important role? We are a serving family. Uh, and this, oh, this weight on my shoulders is there from kindergarten. I can tell you that the, the kindergarten teacher blamed me at the age of four for being too naughty, and that doesn't fit the grandson of the chief rabbi. <laughs> uh, but, I, and, and, and you know, I carry this weight on my shoulders and my, and, and my innermost being as a shliach tzibur, as an emissary of the, of the Jewish people all my life. That's what brought me to, to politics, brought me to uh, go, go through uh, various quarters of, of speaking and, and lecturing and leading and defending and protecting our people. Uh, I'm, I myself am overwhelmed because I'm very proud of it. And, and, I, and the story of my family comes up a lot. Uh, I, also, I had also a few illustrious uncles who were very well known, Yaakov Herzog and Abba Iban and a whole family that's serving for generations. And I'm, you know, people are asking me this question, uh, but they must, they must have been really happy. I'm sure they, they must have been really happy, but I know that the whole door of door, at each generation, you carry on the, uh, the you know, the, the objects and the causes and the, and the targets of that generation. We have huge challenges in this generation. I can learn from my, previous generations, but now it's for me. Now it's on you. That's, that's it. And nobody else. It's my shift. And uh, I think that that's what they would have told me. It's your shift. Do the best you can for your people and your nation. And I intend to do that. Exactly that. Perhaps um, Lacha. We are with you. Very much. And, and we know that you're with us. And that means a lot. And now it's my pleasure to hand out of the Sam Goodwell, the uh, chair of World Karen Hayes. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. As we close, I first want to appreciate my thanks and gratitude on behalf of all of Karen Hayes. So first of all, to all of you, all of the participants from all around Australia, the campaigns in Australia, the community, I can honestly say um, that you are one of the, if not the most important campaign for Karen Ayesod, your ongoing dedicated support really is something that is not taken for granted. I, I don't want to repeat uh, all of the things that were said, but of course, it's important for me to say that, of course, I echo to Chairman Herzog, President-elect Herzog, my friend Buzi, all of the wonderful things that were said by Lance, Stephen, Jeremy. I do just want to add uh, on a personal note that for me, the experience over the last two and a half years, what started as a, as a, as a, a, a relationship between colleagues, and then really, I can say, turned into a good friend, Friendship. a good friend and, and a mentor. And, uh, and for that, uh, I thank you so much. You know, it's interesting, um, Chairman Herzog mentioned, we mentioned so much about his family. The other, the other night, uh, Uji told a story, and I, I, I pledge here that I'm gonna remind you of this at every time we get together in a public setting with Karen Ayesod. Uh, Chairman Herzog told the story about how his very first shlichut, his very first uh, a really public service, if we could call it that. Public appearance. His first public appearance officially representing the state of Israel was for Karen Ayesod. He was sent as a very young man to, to the UK uh, to, to speak and to raise money. 
And so that's where it all started. We can take credit. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan, big fan of Kernel so truly. So we're, we're very proud of that. And, um, you know, I think it's not a coincidence. We heard and we can see, we witnessed so much on this very call, not just with, uh, not just with Bougie's family, but we see so much about multi-generational leadership, Jewish leadership, Israeli leadership from one generation to, to the next, the whole idea of continuity. Uh, of course, so much has been said about uh, Chairman Herzog's grandfather, the chief rabbi. I also heard him talk the other night about his, his other grandfather on his other side, who was also a rabbi, I believe, and was, was supposed to be the, the first, one of, one of the uh, delegates to the very first uh, uh, Zionist, Congress. Zionist Congress in Basel in 1897. So you could see it's uh, from, from all sides. And of course, uh, we mentioned, uh, of course, uh, Buzi's late father, Chaim Herzog, Zichonoli Vacha, the sixth president of Israel, and now him. But we see on this call, and I'm, I'm just giving two examples, but I'm sure with, with, with all members of this call and all of the families, we see uh, Jeremy, and we mentioned Jeremy in his leadership with the Zionist Federation, and his father, Mark, whose leadership is ongoing. We wish you good health to continue and, and all that you do. And we see this example of continuity. And of course, my good friend, Stephen Lowy, we all know um, the story of, of Stephen's father, Frank, and also, of course, his grandfather, Hugo, who perished in the Holocaust. And so there's a clear ex inspiring examples here uh, in terms of responsibility, leadership, passing along what we know that we have a sacred responsibility because we also have a tremendous privilege that we've now returned and built up the, the, the now have sovereignty and a nation state for the, for the people of Israel. And now we have a really uh, a privilege to preserve that and to strengthen it. And so I think, uh, you know, from one generation to the next, you, you manifest that, um, what we see here on this call. And so I want to personally, again, on behalf of all of us, thank you thank again. Thank you very much. Thank you, President-elect Herzog, for all that you've done and continue to do. We're all so proud of you, and we all wish you the Hatzlacha. And thank you all. Shalom to all of you from Yerushalayim. We're now going to close with Hatikva. <laughs> Oh,